An NBA free agency and a stunning day two for your Utah Jazz. Uh, Rudy Gay to a two-year deal. <laughs> Hassan Whiteside uh, on a one-year deal to back up Rudy Gobert. Um, these are two starting caliber players in the NBA, Jake. How shocking is it that the Utah Jazz... I mean, they're one of the most improved teams in the NBA right now. Yeah, there's no doubt they've been really aggressive, and I think this is this is definitely refreshing if you're a Jazz fan. And I think that, you know, we've talked a lot about how, you know, Ryan Smith had a lot to prove this offseason, and he needed to put a stamp on this team, and he needed to get things done. And I, and I feel like now there's no other way to say that he's done just that. You know, he's, he's absolutely... Um, done a great job of bringing in talent to, to help and, and backfill the weaknesses on this team, uh, but also moving on from some some guys who just weren't key contributors like, you know, George Niang and, and some of these other guys. So I, I think they've done a great job. I, I do think that they they have surprised a lot of GMs and front offices in the league who who are just like, wow, the Jazz are being aggressive this offseason. We're, we're really surprised. And so – you know, I think it's a great time to be a Jazz fan. I have to be honest about it. You know, I, I think now you're in a position where you actually have some talent coming off your bench. You actually have somebody other than Jordan Clarkson coming off the bench, and I think that's huge. Now, the only area of, of concern that I might still have um, is just in the hypothetical world, which would be, you know, if Mike Conley gets hurt, assuming he does, because I do think that's still going to happen at some point, he will miss time. You know, who kind of steps into that role? You know, they have not moved on from Joe Ingles yet. So I don't know if they'll just go with the same old Joe's going to play point when Mike is out game plan. But basically, other than that, I think you're in a great spot. You know, adding Rudy Gay um, and Hassan Whiteside really backfill a lot of your needs. And I think. You will see Hassan Whiteside a lot. This is not a guy who is going to play the same amount of minutes that Derek Favors did. He's going to play a lot more, in my opinion. He's he's probably twice the player that Derek uh, is today, and I think the Jazz really need that, and I think this allows them to really protect themselves against that mobile big that we saw them struggle against so much. So I think they had a uh, – that well, you know, we shouldn't – assume that they're done yet, but they've had a hell of a run here so far, and I think that they've done a great job with this roster, and, and you should be really excited if you're a Jazz fan. Yeah, and I think for the first time in a long time, you can really say that the Jazz are leading the way in the NBA, and, you know, usually when you get, um, you know, when you get that kind of traction and you get those kind of headlines, usually it means that you're being financially irresponsible, but, you know, I can also say that I feel like the Utah Jazz have spent wisely here. I mean, the, there was no doubt you had to add depth to this team. Last year, you had zero depth. Um, you had very little contribution outside of Jordan Clarkson off your bench. Um, and I certainly think with the way that we've seen guys like Joe Ingles slow down a little bit, you've, you had to find quality contributions off the bench. And I think you've done that. I think you've upgraded Derek Favor, certainly with Hassan Whiteside. And there's no doubt now that you know, Rudy Gay is going to play three positions for you. He can play, you know, from the three, the four. In small ball sets, he can play the five. Um, you can play, you know, Rudy Gay and Hassan Whiteside on the floor together or Rudy Gobert. Like, you have this flexibility now that gives Quinn Snyder the ability to play smaller basketball. It gives him the ability to match up with teams like the Lakers and Clippers when they go smaller, which was something that he simply did not have a year ago. So I don't think there's any question that this roster is better prepared to win than last year's roster. But I look at what's happening in the NBA now, and I look at the L.A. Lakers, and I say to myself, my God, the Lakers added everybody. Yeah. And I think that you know there were a lot of jokes made about uh, Carmelo Anthony yesterday on, on Twitter and I'm telling you that Carmelo Anthony has turned himself into an elite mid-range player. And he's a guy that showed in Portland he can play with his back to the basket. He can shoot the three. He can still run the floor. Um, he is a, a, a willing passer. I mean, to me, Jake, Carmelo Anthony was a big addition. And they had many big additions, the least of which was not Russell Westbrook, obviously. Right. But... Carmelo Anthony was a significant addition to that team yesterday. Yeah, I think Melo is somebody who's who's always had, you know, the 
the post up back to the basket game. I mean, I think that's, you know, what he's made his career on, but I think his real improvement and his real shining moment now is that he's able to space the floor. And I, and I think in the NBA specifically with the Lakers setup, they need that. They cannot have a situation where, you know, Russ or LeBron don't have the ability to drive the paint because the, the they're stacking the paint that can't happen. So Mello is going to be in the corner on the wing, you know, in those situations. And he's going to pull those defenders away from the basket because he makes it at such a high rate. So that's, that's his value. Now, you know, a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, this is just LeBron bringing in his boy and, you know, Melo doesn't have a ring yet. And LeBron's trying to change that, you know, and, and yeah, some of that might be true. It's, it's no secret that, you know, they've been playing, playing against each other since they came into the draft together, but it's also true that they're really close friends. So, you know, I think, yeah, it's partly that they wanted to play together. But I also think a lot of this is that Melo is actually a really good player still. And I think if you watched, um, you know, when Portland came to town this past season to play the Jazz and they won that game, you know, Melo made a bunch of shots in that game. He he had a big impact. And, and I just think overall, um, you know, a lot of people are going to say that this Lakers squad is old and they're, they're going to be injury prone and they're not going to be able to survive. And I don't know that that's necessarily true. I think that they have to play the right way. They have to play smart. They got to play team basketball, and and they'll be fine. But Carmelo Anthony will contribute for this team, and I'm telling you, it's more than just LeBron signing his boy. Well, and I think that's one of the things that you have to consider, and you also have to consider now the way business is being done in the NBA. There's no doubt in just about anybody's mind. Like this, the Lakers situation is a good example. The, I mean, the Jazz situation is a good example. I mean, yeah. NBA sources last night were telling us that. Um, you know, they're shocked around the league at how aggressive that the Utah Jazz have been. Um, and that two factors really played into their ability to close on a guy like Rudy Gay and, and also Hassan Whiteside, who, by the way, um, it, you know, we're told both of those guys had multiple suitors. The story is that, you know, Dwayne Wade's influence and the desire to play with Donovan Mitchell were two of the biggest factors in getting Rudy, go, uh, excuse me, Rudy Gay and Hassan Whiteside on this roster, signing contracts in, in Salt Lake City. Like, that's a big deal in terms of who the Jazz have always been and who the Jazz are turning into. And when we talk about the Utah Jazz, this is a complete departure from what we've always seen. And certainly in the last decade, uh, under, under you know, Gail Miller and, and Dennis Lindsay, I mean, the conservative nature of of this organization is why they did not win. The talent I think at times has been here, the money and the support and the the what's the right word? The the fortitude of the ownership group was not always here. And you know, Dennis Lindsay has a lot of moles, but listen, that that's a guy that didn't always have free hands to do what he wanted to do. And I'm not saying he did a good job with the moves he made cuz clearly he did not. Mm -hmm. But what you're seeing now is you're seeing Ryan Smith surround himself with guys who know how to do what he wants to do. Because Ryan Smith doesn't know how to build an NBA franchise. He doesn't know how to go out and get NBA free agents. But what he does know how to do is to hire smart guys like Dwayne Wade and Danny Ainge to be around him. Um, you have smart guys to like Justin Zanuck, who clearly is in like mind and lockstep with Ryan Smith. Definitely. And you, yeah, you surround yourself with those guys and you let them do their job. You say to them, hey, you handle the basketballing, I'll handle the check cutting. And I think certainly now it is a little surprising, and, and there are NBA executives and people in NBA circles that are surprised the Utah Jazz are so willing to continue to stack luxury tax onto the, to, to their payroll. And frankly, I'm one of those guys, Jake, I'm really surprised that there is so much willingness at this early stage in his ownership to pay luxury tax, but but what what surprises you about it? Just just from like um, you know, just from like a, a traditional standpoint, just from like a what like like hey, this guy's a new owner, so you would think that he wouldn't be ready to do that kind of thing, or what? No, I I think when you are a titan of business the way that Ryan Smith has been, mm -hmm. um, and there's no doubt with what he did and how he flipped Qualtronics that he is a very smart businessman and good with numbers. Yes. Um. You don't generally just come in and flash cash. You don't walk into the strip club and say, "Hey, look at my brick of you know one billion dollar bills." Like you just that's not the way you do business. Do you right? think that's what he's doing here though? Because because I I kind of feel like it's well, it's one of these situations where 
you know, you said something there a minute ago that that I that I really agree with, which is which is Ryan Smith is really smart at at business, meaning that he understands that he's not a you know the president of basketball operations. He's not the guy that that knows you know players and what and, and what player is going to do this and that. But what he does know is that he's got guys around him who do know that. And if he and if he trusts them and if he funds them and feeds them, basically if he waters the plant that this team is going to get better. And that to me is 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 kind of the takeaway that I have. You know, I I look at I, I guess I just don't agree that he's, you know, coming in here and flashing a bunch of money be, and trying to be boisterous about but it. But under but understand what I what I mean by that. Yeah. What I mean by that is he's coming in and he's spending significantly more money than this franchise and this market has ever bore. Yeah, and and, it, and I think that's the right thing to be doing. That's uh, where they are. I would and you know when has that ever worked out in sports? And it, whether you go to F1 teams who, you know, show up and all of a sudden spend billions and they don't win, or you go to the New York Yankees who spend billions and don't win, generally speaking, when you walk in the front door and all you're doing is buying everything and everyone, there is a lull there. This yeah. team... I, the Utah Jazz. I mean, listen, they're paying. They're one of the the what are they six eight teams right now? I think there are nine teams that are paying the luxury tax. But read some of the figures of the of the of the highest taxpayers in the league right now. Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Nets are paying one hundred and twenty five point nine million dollars. They are thirty eight point two million dollars into luxury tax. Okay. Number two is Golden State, thirty four million dollars in the luxury tax. Their tax bill as a repeat payer. A repeat repeat offender is one hundred and thirty nine point two million dollars. Okay, and then it falls off precipitously to the Chicago Bulls, who are twenty five million dollars in, and their bill is sixty seven point seven. Uh huh. It goes to the Miami Heat at four, who are sixteen point six million in, and or sixteen point one million in, and they're paying thirty two point five million dollars in luxury tax. The Milwaukee Bucks are twelve point seven million in. And they are paying $23.1 million in luxury tax. Then you have the Lakers at six, $10 million over, $16.3 million in luxury tax. And then you have the Utah Jazz, 7.5 today. This is only numbers, by the way, today. $7.5 million, their luxury tax bill right now is $11.9 million. So in a market where you don't have one of the top revenue generating arenas, because you don't. Um, and you don't have the, the revenue streams. You don't have your own, you have a terrible TV deal. You don't have a digital rights deal. Um, you don't have, you know, like one of the things that you see in, in, you know, commonalities here, you look at Brooklyn, um, the Warriors have it on, on, you know, NBC sports Bay area. Um, you look at Boston's got it. All these big market teams that are paying the luxury tax, Chicago, the Bulls absolutely have it. They have 24-7 television programming dedicated to them. Um, I can tell you the Lakers are the model for that with Sportsnet LA. Um, and, I mean, the Dodgers and the Lakers have year-round programming, behind the scenes, specials, training camps, summer league, yeah. the, at the draft, like you, following LeBron around, LeBron the industry guy, like – the Jazz don't have that. That's all money they're not making. They're not making Staples Center money. They're not making Barclays Center money. But how do you get there? Well, how you get there um, is I think that's where you have to spend your money. I, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when when they re-upped with AT&T, which is just an, a dog a shit TV decision. deal. Yeah. But it's not a dumb decision. I think it's where they are, though. Ryan, Ryan Smith is just now getting his hands around this franchise – or at that point was, and a lot of people said, hey, that's a dumb decision. you got to have a TV deal. What I'm telling you is this is not a dumb decision. It's who you are and where you are. It's not where you're going or who you're going to be. Paying $20 million in luxury tax is a mistake right now. And that that's the only pause that I have. I'm not saying they've made a single mistake. I don't believe they have. You've got to get your financial house in order. you got to have a TV deal. got to have a streaming deal. Got to have a rights deal. Got to have a, they do pretty well on Twitter, but they need to produce. They need to have a TV production in-house 
that produces unique live content that follows Donovan Mitchell throughout his summer, um, that when he was hurt, what Kobe did. I mean, following Kobe around on his, on his rehab was one of the greatest Showtime specials I think anybody's ever seen. Mm-hmm. People ate that up. Can you imagine if the, the Jazz had been able to follow Donovan Mitchell around rehabbing his ankle? Yeah, I mean, yes, I think that would be great. I mean, it would, but I, I, I don't know. I, I guess I, I find myself feeling like you know, you, you, you can't do everything all in one year, and winning cures all, right? You can't tell me that 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 yep. going to the NBA Finals, even if you didn't win the NBA Finals, but just making a trip to the NBA Finals, you can't tell me that they wouldn't make a ton of money off of that. You can't tell me that that wouldn't bring well, more yeah, revenue. Well, uh, yeah, of course you like, would. But then that brings that brings you to this other question: mm-hmm. Are the Jazz? legitimate NBA championship contenders right now. Yes, I do think they are. Now wow. with, now with their depth, I think they are. So yeah. you believe that Hassan Whiteside and Rudy Gay have made them a championship caliber yes, team? Yes, because I think now you have someone coming off the bench who's worth a damn. Now you're not talking about George and Yang coming off the bench and okay. giving you meaningless minutes in games of leverage. You're talking about um, you know, you're talking about a guy in Hassan Whiteside who I'm not saying he's 20 and 10 every night or anything like that, but what I am saying is that he can come in and make a difference for you where Derek Favors wasn't doing that. That's yeah. not what it was. And I, I think, unfortunately, you know, if you look at some of the other teams that have, have spent a lot of money, I mean, um, you have a lot of those teams that have younger players that are the core of their team. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Lakers, you know, unfortunately, the Lakers are that team where you don't have to worry about how much money you spend. The Lakers are just a revenue-generating machine. That's an ATM machine there. So I think you kind of throw that out. I would just be cautious and careful with, with how much luxury tax you pay. I mean, you're a billionaire. You've got the money. I totally get that. But that you didn't become a billionaire by just giving your money away. Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I'm not trying to be argumentative about it. I just think that that they're not in a position as a team to, I don't think that they're in a position as a team to just kind of run out here and be, be you know, super mediocre or anything. I think they feel a lot of pressure to, to like Ryan Smith, in my opinion, feels a lot of pressure to win and to be successful on the court. And I think that, you know, coming into an organization that's in this position, because it, it's not like he acquired the Jazz when they were a lottery team. You know, it's not like th- that. It's not like he has, you know, year after year after year to just be bad right now. You know, that's not that's not where the organization is at, and that's not where the expectation of of anybody on the team is at. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not like Donovan Mitchell is going to be cool with being, you know, a borderline playoff team like let's say the Warriors were last year. You know, no, not at all. And I, and, and by the way, that's that's not at all what I'm saying. And I I, I just want some caution. Mm-hmm. Because these situations, when what's worst case scenario though? Like, okay, so let's say that he does. Let's say that you know, uh, you know that he's just been throwing money at this thing, you know, and he's been pretty, pretty like willy nilly with it. He's not really cared too much about mm-hmm. how much they're spending. I mean, what, yeah. what, what is the worst case scenario or repercussion for that? Or injuries, consequence? injuries, and then you don't have the money to backfill those injuries. Mm-hmm. That's the in in the case of the the Utah Jazz. And you know what? You know, a lot of people have asked me about, you know, like, are they going to make more moves? I have to think there's other moves in the works. And if they're not now, they'll be at the deadline. I think Joe Ingles is the guy that everybody talks about. And it's simply because he's an expiring contract making $13 million. Why would you not move him? Uh, Well, and I think there's a lot of value in moving him at the deadline. We're leading up to the deadline because you have to, one of the things you have to do here is you have to wait and figure out how this team comes together. And again, I think when you have a guy like Justin Zanuck, who's clearly proving himself to be a, a, a very good executive, and you have a guy in Dwayne Wade whose value has already been paid for 10 times over, yeah. um, you know, and, and who knows, really, there's a lot of people wondering what Danny Ainge is doing or if he is working or, you know, is he, how is he advising Ryan Smith? I don't know at this point. But what I'm saying is whatever they're doing is working. You don't have to go and make another move. Mm -hmm. And when I say another move, another major move. You're going to sign your draft picks. You're going to have your young guys. By the way, Summer League yesterday was not very pretty. Um, You know, I mean, Jarrell Brantley, I think, showed out. You had some good moments on the guys you expect to have some good moments. So you're going to have some young guys on this roster. The worst thing that could happen here, worst case scenario, is a repeat of the injuries from last year. Um, because again, I still think 
Now your biggest concern is depth at point guard. Mm-hmm. Because if Mike Conley gets hurt, you're relying on a very young guy that's unproven in the NBA who you just drafted to come in and make a big impact right away. Um, you know, and other than that, you're 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 going to put Don on the ball. You're going to put Joe Ingles on the ball. That concerns you a little bit, right? Yeah. Because now power forward and point guard are your the two positions where you really want to find somebody to upgrade those positions. Like we were talking about before the show this morning. Who are your starting five right now? Because if you sign Rudy Gay and Hassan Whiteside certainly is not going to start over Rudy Gobert. But I think I can make a pretty strong argument that Rudy Gay should be one of your five best players on your roster. Yeah, well, we know who three of them are, right? So we know that it's Don Bogey and Rudy. We know. I that, would agree with know, that. We, we know I would that agree we have that. those three that are going to be starting every single night, no matter what. And so I think, you know, I, 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 I then look at the other two, and you're like, all right, well, if Conley's healthy, yes, he's going to be starting. So for the first twenty games, it'll be it'll be those four. You know, you figure at least it'll be those four. And then the fifth guy, I think I don't think it's actually a lock that that Royce is going to start. I, I I think that they 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 need to take a serious look at at who they're playing on a nightly basis and 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 where Royce slots in because I think yeah I do think there will be times that Rudy Gay starts. I think he brings de- you know pretty solid defense. He definitely brings great mid range uh, and he brings size, which I think is huge. That's the other thing with Royce O'Neal. He's, I'm not saying he's undersized, but he's not He's not plus-plus size for his position, you know? So Rudy Gay definitely brings good size to his position. So I just think that at the end of the day, this is how I like to characterize what the Jazz have done. Last year we had all, or this past team that, that got knocked out, one of the main complaints that Quinn Snyder had and that we had was that he didn't have enough ways to win ball games. He didn't right. have enough answers. There wasn't enough flexibility in the roster. He was playing with one hand tied behind his back. Well, now, for the most part, outside the point guard position behind Mike, I think that's taken away now. That excuse is gone because you now have a mobile big. You now have a guy in Rudy Gay that can play, you know, damn near four positions. He's probably not going to play point guard much, but he can play three positions if you really ask him to. So, you yeah. know, you have flexibility in what you can do with this roster. So I just think that at the end of the day, yes, I'd like to see them move jingles and and go and get a point guard, uh, that a legitimate, proven you know, Austin Rivers level kind of backup. But, you know, other than that, I think they've they've done a great job and they're in a good spot. Yeah, we'll see. It's um it's certainly a delight to be sitting here talking about the Jazz spending money and the Jazz, you know, being aggressive, being one of the leaders in the free agent market because it has been a long time. Man, it has been probably 15, 20 years since I mean, you can point to some one offs, the Carlos Boozers of the world, like you can put, point to some one-offs where the Jazz were super aggressive. Mm-hmm. Usually, the Jazz are on the wrong end of this. Usually, it's Gordon Hayward leaving, or and it, so it's nice to be sitting here talking about the Jazz being one of the leaders in the market um, of of NBA free agency. I just think it is. This is if you're a Jazz fan, this is really encouraging. Yeah. Um, all right, let's get some of your comments in here. Uh, James Knight says, "I'm agreeing with everything you say today, guys." Okay which usually means he won't. Brylark uh, says, Morning, boys. How much of this aggressiveness is Ryan Smith influence uh, aided by Dwayne Wade? Um, I don't know that the aggressive attitude is influenced by Dwayne Wade. I think, I think I've think i heard repeatedly that Dwayne Wade is, has had a major impact on guys' willingness to listen, and the sales pitch is what's closing. Playing with Donovan Mitchell – being around an organization that is all in, that's one thing that absolutely has changed in the last year. The Utah Jazz are all in on winning a championship. Yeah. Plain and simple. There is there is no argument about that. Uh, Macon Convo says, you guys are perfect and never wrong. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. Well, finally, somebody understands the the, the base of this show. Yeah. I mean, and, you know. You know, by the way, we're also good looking. Uh, Richard uh, Wingett says, really enjoy listening. Thanks, Richard. Appreciate that. Brandon Whiteside says, uh, Whiteside, what a great name. Can't wait to get a jersey. Exactly. Brandon, this is probably a little perverse. I thought about you last night while thinking about Hassan Whiteside. Having fun is the name of the game. That's what I'm saying. Gabe Ledley says, come for the jazz negativity. Stay for the vaccine brainwashing. Let's go. Good to see you, Gabe. Appreciate that. Uh, Cody Strickland says, good morning, guys. I missed a lot, but was finishing up an episode of Grocock getting Xbox 
because of his name. Yeah. WTF. How about the other 1,499 people who signed up waiting for the draw? Hey, bro, you weren't here on that day, dude. You were not here on that day. You don't know what happened, my guy. There were there were probably 40 people who wanted him to win it. There was a movement. There was absolutely a migration of people who wanted him to win it. There was a lot of support for that growing cock, so just realize. And by the way, by the way, I'd just like to point out, the $112 I spent shipping it to Australia, <laughs> oh. yeah, you know, the, you know, so it's not like yeah, I was... Yeah, we paid a hefty price yeah. for that moment. Yeah. I mean, my God. Uh, James Knight said, is the prerequisite to be on the Lakers roster that you need to be a 30-something? Well, you have to show that A, you're vaccinated, and B, you're a member of AARP. Um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Cody also says, I hate the NBA free agency right now. Yeah, Jazz got two decent picks, but maybe Aaron Rodgers should request a trade to the Lakers or the Nets. Okay. Seriously. Uh, we need at least one backup point guard to make this a good offseason for us because we know Conley is going to be hurt at playoff time. Yeah, I, I'm curious to see how this team goes about their physio work. Their, how are they going to go about load managing, training? Um, you know, Mike Conley, you know, a, a, a few days ago I had heard that he really wants to prove he can stay healthy for a season. Well, I'm hoping that means that he is going to invest in his hamstrings um, cause that's, what's plagued him. Um, I would hope that he would invest in, you know, his soft, soft tissue management and strength, flexibility, dexterity, like all of those things that have plagued Mike Conley. Let's hope that he invested in those to show that he can stay healthy. Um, Tanner Plummer says, it's strange that you guys are talking positively about the jazz, LOL. Just kidding. Okay. Uh, just kidding. Um, do we support trading Ingles? What available deals are there? You know, I do support trading Joe Ingles because he has value. Joe Ingles, though, and I think this is one of the things that gets lost in these conversations, Joe Ingles is a really good teammate. He is one of those glue guys on this roster that when there's 38 seconds to go in the game and you're trying to figure out how you're going to you know, do X, Y, and Z, and the coaches are huddled up, you know, drawing up a play. Yeah. Joe Ingles is that guy that will pipe up and, and have the right thing at the right time to say to, to this club yeah. and to this huddle. And in practice, he keeps it light, and he presents Jordan Clarkson with his Sixth Man of the Year award, and there's a real value in those guys. And I hope that when, when we're talking about trading a guy like Joe Ingles, I hope that we all have that as part of this conversation. Because you cannot put a value on that. You cannot overstate the value of Joe Ingles, the statesman, to this organization. Because it's it's massive. It's huge. It's it's as much as Donovan Mitchell, and I don't know that people realize that. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely an important player to the team, but I think if you want to win a championship, you're going to trade Joe Ingles. And, and I say that because... At the end of the day, you know, yes, all of what you just said is true, but at the end of the day, you can't be you can't be loyal in sports. You know what I mean? It's cool that he's a glue guy. It's cool that he does all these intangible things. But at the end of the day, if you want to win a championship, you got to have someone coming off the bench behind Mike Conley who's That's capable right. of starting. That's right. And so I don't, you know, respectfully to Joe Ingles, I don't really give a damn if he's a glue guy on this team. I care about what I'm going to do. 35 games into the year when we're five back of the Lakers because we've been struggling a little bit and Mike Conley's hurt and that's why we've been struggling. What are we going to what's the answer to that question? Cuz not cuz having no answer is not going to be good enough. We've already been through that yeah. and having no answer behind Mike Conley makes all these phenomenal signings worthless because you're not going to be the team that you should be without a quality point guard. I agree. Uh Brandon Whiteside says Suns and Lakers spend and they're amazing. Jazz do it and they're making a mistake. Bro, are you even listening to the show? Like, legit, bro. Like, you, are you even listening to what we're saying? You cannot compare what the Suns and Lakers are doing to the Jazz. And by the way, I would remind you that it's not like the Suns threw a bunch of money all over the place. We just said a bunch of positive stuff about the Jazz. <laughs> and you're sitting here saying that we're saying negative things about the Jazz. The Lakers, I and I think I just detailed this. Yeah. The Lakers make more money taking a dump than the Jazz make in an entire month. They accidentally make money like every five minutes. And it, it, they're the Lakers. They're a heritage, long-time foundational brands, teams. man. I mean, yeah. they're the Montreal Canadiens. They're the, you know, they're the, the, the Green Bay Packers. They're the, I mean, they're the Lakers. 
You cannot compare yourself to them. Cannot compare yourself to the Knicks who have been terrible and still make tons of money. Mm-hmm. You can't compare yourself to those teams. Boston Celtics, dude. Yeah, compare yourself to Miami, Orlando, Milwaukee, Minnesota. Portland? Portland, Denver. Those are the teams you compare yourself to. And right now, when you are when you are as transitional as you are, and I think the Jazz are in transition. What does from, that mean exactly? Well, I, I think every phase of their business is in transition. You are learning how how to do if you're Ryan Smith, you're learning how to run an NBA franchise. Right. If you work for Ryan Smith, you're learning how he wants to run his franchise. Um, if you are in the basketball ops department, if you're Justin Zanuck and you know everybody that's around him. You're learning how Justin Zanuck wants basketball operations run for this team, and you're learning, you know, what you're going to do versus what you've always done. Like, I mean, everything about this team is in transition. The the marketing, the money, the dollars being spent, all of that is in transition. And until until you come out of that, you're not really going to have an idea of what your typical modus operandi or way that you operate is. So it worries you a little bit when you're already paying a significant luxury tax bill. Yeah. And when you know the owner of the team is tweeting about Joe Ingles, that worries you a little bit because that shows you he's got it's a two-sided coin. You know, like it's the Harvey Dent coin. Well, one side of it is hey, he's willing to spend a ton of money. That's great. Cool. The other side of it is, well, he's willing to spend a ton of money. Oh shit, what are we going to do? When in two years, this luxury tax, we're a repeat offender on the luxury tax, and we can't afford to go and get Rudy Gay or Hassan Whiteside, Mm -hmm. or we're mediocre, what happens if you spend spend all this money in the luxury tax? Yeah. What if you don't win? You tried. You did everything you could. What if you don't win, though? You did everything you could. It was all for nothing. And this is why I've said for months and months... Suffer now so you can win three rings in 10 years. That's what this is about. It's not about winning right now today. Going back to the Western Conference playoffs is not good enough. Beating the Memphis Grizzlies is not good enough. Losing to the Clippers is not good enough. Not going to the finals, not going to the NBA finals is not good enough. You have to win a championship. You know what the problem with that is? You don't have a Giannis to just hand the ball to and get me 50. You don't have that guy. See, with, now people would disagree with you. Like, I know there are definitely people out there who would say that Don is that guy. He's not that guy. Donovan Mitchell is Donovan Mitchell's not the guy that you hand the ball to and say, get us 50 and dominate the entire game and let's go win a championship. Because you know what you don't also have at this very moment in time? Who's your P.J. Tucker? Mm-hmm. Think about who's your Drew Holiday? Who's your Chris Middleton? Do you have a Chris Middleton on this team? No. You don't. And so... What the what the the Bucks did was they used everybody they had. Pat yeah. Connaughton, they used everybody they had. Brooke Lopez, oh excuse me, Lopez. Like you used everybody you have, and pretty much everybody that played on that roster gave you something. Bobby Portis, <laughs> Bobby Portis. Gave you huge minutes that's, and big threes. That's what I'm saying. You have to have depth behind Mike Conley. It, it, it just is not, not a negotiable if you want to win an NBA championship. And again, I know that I, I can already see people saying that, that Don's better than, well, I'm telling you, he's not better than Giannis because Giannis has a ring and Don doesn't. I mean, it is that. Do you By the understand? Way, Giannis is an MVP. We'll just point that out. So when I was getting the finger in the butt yesterday, Wow. Um, oh, wow. I mean, when I was getting the physical, that's like, HIPAA? yeah, that's it. But I was getting my physical wow. yesterday. <laughs> wow. And it turns out that the, uh, the doctor's a huge jazz fan, um, who had actually heard of our show, by the way, he'd heard of our show. Yes. He had heard of our show. And you know, <laughs> you know what the funny thing is? He's like, you know, I always wanted to come by K fan and get one of those free lottery tickets. Yep. He never did. Uh, anyway, the point is we were talking about Giannis's knee and he's like, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. I've never seen anybody hurt their knee like that and then come back and score 50. That's exactly right. Yeah. Neither have I, neither is anybody. Nobody has. Yeah. The point is the Milwaukee bucks and I don't care who was injured and I don't care. It's awfully convenient to say, Oh, Brooklyn was injured. 
and you were all like, oh, they bought their champion. Like, it doesn't Can't have matter. it both it, ways, it, boss. It doesn't matter. The, the Milwaukee Bucks won a championship because of Giannis and their core role players doing their job. Chris Middleton, dagger at the end of the last game. Oh, and it, it, it just, that's what worries you. This Jazz team doesn't have that it yet. Now, when we get to April and May, will they have it? I would certainly like to think so. I, they have a bunch of veterans on this team now who know how to mentor guys because, uh, you know, one of the guys I think that needs to change his mentality is Boyan Bogdanovich. Yeah. Right? Like, and there's nobody better to do that than Rudy Gay. Rudy Gay is a 86-year veteran in the NBA who is going to impact your younger players. Look at Jarrell Brantley last night. Jarrell Brantley needs some mentoring. Right? Elijah Hughes needs some mentoring. You know, Yudoka Azabuki looks a heavier to me, by the way. He's got a lot of junk in the trunk. Mm -hmm. He hasn't he, played five-on-five -five basketball in eight months. Yeah, he needs some mentoring. He needs reps. So, for me, I think you have to find a way um, to build to build chemistry on this team. But here, near there. Okay, now, before you read all these comments, yeah. I just want to I just want to do the classic, take a wild guess at what's in the comments right now. Okay. Because I can't see them, and I'm just going to go ahead and take a guess that Jazz fans are all pissed off that you just said that Donovan Mitchell is not a go-and-get go and get 50 guy. Just a um, guess. Yeah, but a bunch of those have been blocked. Oh, okay. YouTube removed a bunch of comments. Oh, Mark J. Wow, Mark J. back in the hizzy. What's up, Mark? Good to see you. He says, great show, guys. Good to be back watching after... <gasps> Oh, wow. Being in the ICU with COVID. Oh, damn. Oh, no. Are you I back mean, home? Did you guys see the the uh, percentages that came out? 93% of all COVID cases in the U.S. are now um, Delta variant. The coronavirus. 93%. Put a mask on, mm -hmm. my friends. Put a mask on. Mm -hmm. Mark J., two questions. Was it Delta? And how do you know where you got it? He also says, will the recent signings get the Jazz to the Western Conference Finals? You know, that's hard to say because we got to wait and see what happens with Kawhi and the Clippers. Um, you got to wait and see how Golden State comes together. I mean, the, I think the Lakers are the best team in the NBA. I mean, if you, if now they're all, again, those guys are all, you know, going to show up with osteoporosis and walkers uh, for pregame warm up. Um, Don't be rude. No, nah, I'm trying not to, sir. I apologize. Um, the Lakers are older, but. My God, they got they filled everything they needed to fill. I mean, you got a a tremendous asset in, in I mean, just about every one of those signings was like, wow, wow, yeah. whoa, let's go. Like, yeah, like <laughs> like my God, bro. Yeah. Like, what are we what are we doing? And Being the Lakers, bro. You know, I, I look at the way that <laughs> I look at the way that it, now again, if if we're talking about you know, real numbers, uh -huh. the Lakers are actually in a pretty good place financially for who they are in, in the way that they, you know, the way that they operate. But I, I look at some of their stuff. Yeah. You know, that, that Talon Horton Tucker returns, that deal's done. That they went and got a young guy like Kendrick Nunn. That um, was a out-of-the-blue signing. That, that was, was a wow. Um, Carmelo Anthony, Trevor Ariza, Wayne Ellington. 42% three-point shooter. Mm -hmm. Can't, those don't grow on trees. Mm -hmm. That Dwight Howard, who by some estimations had 10 teams chasing him, yeah, went back to the Lakers. He wants to win another ring. Kent Bazemore. Malik Monk from Charlotte. Yeah. Malik Monk's a baller. Yeah. I mean, like him, Kendrick Nunn, that's the deepest. And that's the great thing, though. All those guys, they don't have to be key contributors. They can yeah. be role players, which is great. That's, that's what you want. That's the deepest Laker team I think I've seen in some years. Yeah. Like they have, they legit now, have ten guys that can do the do the deal. But again, we, we this is all with the assumption that you know Anthony Davis and LeBron and Russ and all these guys stay yeah. healthy. That's the assumption, you know. And I, I would assume LeBron would be healthy. This is the first off season he's had to really chill in a while, long, many many years. You know, AD is the guy that I'm really man. worried about, man. I mean that that groin and the leg issues plague him, and and I just don't know. I have to think that LeBron has gotten into him. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I know, you dude. can't, Anthony. Ugh, Anthony Street Clothes Davis. Anthony Street Clothes Davis. Shut up. Anyway, the point is, um, I'm not a Charles Barkley guy at all. Um, you leave. You can stay and shut up and act like an adult. Yeah, for once, Chuck. Um, you know, my feeling is that when I I look at 
Anthony Davis and, and the way that that roster is built, I have to think LeBron has said to him, do you want to win or do you want to just show up every year? 